Good morning, everyone. It's fantastic to see some new faces this morning. And to all you watching online, we're really glad that you're with us here this morning. So if you guys would like to stand up, we're going to uh, get into some worship. And I'm just going to pray before we get started, all right? God, we thank you um, that you go before us, Lord Father. We thank you that you're here this morning with us, God. I pray that as we worship you, Lord Father, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, God. And God, that your presence will just be just be ever present with us here this morning, Lord Father. God, I just pray um, that you would just be with us, Jesus, in your holy and precious name. Amen. In the process, in the waiting, you're making melodies over me. And your presence is a promise, for I am a pilgrim on a journey. you 
communion a little bit different this morning we're just gonna rest in this moment where we've been calling upon the name of Jesus we're here at his throne we're here at his feet um, and we're gonna break uh, bread um, and drink the juice together in this moment so if you're at home and uh, watching online we encourage you to do that too um, and we've been singing all these songs about taking a step out and reaching out to Jesus and knowing that he is with us when we take those leaps and we we push against the fear and we walk out so as we're standing here and as we're looking to the throne as we're resting in his embrace it is right there that we are being held that we are being called we are being loved and we, that is the place of where we come and we accept his forgiveness we're able to pour out our hearts because we know that everything that we come and leave before Jesus, he takes it, he washes our tears away, and he washes us with forgiveness. So I just encourage each and every single one of you now to just come before him, accept his forgiveness, and just bask in his love, bask in his embrace, and call upon his beautiful name. So I'm just going to pray over us. God, we thank you so much, God, that we can call upon your name. Lord Father, that us... Um, 
imperfect people, sinful people, Lord Father, can call you Abba Father. God, that we can enter into your presence, God. And God, we can just be honest and holy ourselves, Lord Father, at your feet. God, I pray, God, for each person here, God, that we would know your love. We would know um, the height and depth of it, Lord Father, God. And God, Father, that we would just accept your forgiveness, Lord Father, um, because you've paid the price, Jesus. We love you and thank you in your holy and precious name. morning everybody if you didn't have anxiety before you came that music probably gave you anxiety we got to switch that up <laughs> that music is frightening um, you're all very welcome this morning for those of you watching online you're all very welcome um, leave some comments and notes let us know you're there um, let us know how we could be praying for you uh, but isn't it wonderful for those of you who are here isn't it wonderful to be back together again it's so lovely to see people it's, isn't it like it's just wonderful to be here again I love it you know, we're, we're three weeks back, um, and obviously there's still a little, you know, tension, and people still have that anxiety. So, you know, for those of you watching at home, we, we, you know, respect your decision to be there. For those of you who are here, thank you for, you know, obeying the social distancing and, and all the things we, we've put in place. So, if you missed last week, we started a series on fearless. And what we started talking about was, how do you and I, when we face uncertain times, when we face trials, and when we face danger, how do we handle that? Do we stand firm with God, or do we allow it, let us drift away in our faith? You know, does it, does it draw us closer to God, or does it take us away from God? And I think a lot of times when we anticipate danger, or when we feel there's danger, we know what we say we're going to do, right? Oh, well, if I faced that, this is what I would have done. And we all have that friend, don't we? 
oh, if I were you, I would have. <laughs> or if I was him, I would have. You know, we all have that one person who, who kind of knows, knows what you should exactly do with your life and, and your job. But what do you do when you actually go through it? You know, because when we can anticipate fear or danger or, or circumstances, going through it is very different than planning to go through it. Because when you plan to go through it, the emotion and the fear and the anxiety really isn't there. So when you are going through it, all these things, all these feelings and emotions distract us and they help us, they make us, sorry, not make logical decisions quite often. So so often going through fearful times, you know, it can decrease our faith and sometimes make us forget about God. Or it can increase our faith. And I think a big factor in whether it decreases and makes you drift from God or draws you closer to God it often depends on the people around us, doesn't it? Do you, do you have a people around you? Do you have a support system around you that, that encourages towards God? That, that, you know, when we go through tough times, do you have people there to grab you by the hand and say, let's pray about this. Let's talk about this. Let's, let's get this out and bring it to God together to know you're not on your own. You're not facing this situation on your own. And I think it's so important that as followers of Jesus that we have this support system around us, that Christianity, our faith, was never, ever meant to be done on our own. It was meant to be done as a group and as a team and as, as a body of believers together. But I think oftentimes <laughs> Irish culture, I love it. There's, I love it. But so uh, we are so cruel to each other. We're so cruel to each other. You know, we, we, we're, we're just a cut-down culture. You know, you might do something great a hundred times and nobody will say a thing. You make one mistake <laughs> and the texts come through and the comments come through and, you know, all these things. You know, because we, we kind of just point out the faults we see. Imagine if we reversed it. You know, every single week we've been back. We've been back three weeks or a month, whatever, maybe. Every single week we've prayed before service that people leave more encouraged than when they come in. And I hope that's true. But that only happens when other people encourage. <laughs> you know, are, are you investing and encouraging people, telling them, hey, it's good to see you, you know, how can I be praying for you? Or do we just expect that done to us? You know, as a body, we should be leaving here you know, just more filled up with the Spirit and more encouraged than, than when we came in the door. Because if we can't encourage each other, each other in our faith and build each other up in our faith, who's going to do it for us? You know, yes, we need to depend on God, but it's up to us to encourage each other towards God. So this morning, I want to look at a person in Scripture and see how his faith and the people around him encouraged him towards God. You see, this person we're going to be looking at this morning, he faced real danger and had actually so much anxiety about it. Like Moses last week, he, he kind of protested to God, and he started saying, I, I'm not the right man for the job. But in 2 Timothy 1, 7, here's what it says. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Now, who here, when they're going through tough times, fearful times, when they're observed, say, man, that person is full of power and love and of sound mind. Who, when we observe someone who's going through, you see, I, you remember the movie um, uh, The Lion King? You know, there's a scene in The Lion King where, where uh, Le, uh, what's her name? Nala is chasing Pumba, you know, and, and she's about to eat him, and he gets stuck in the tree. You remember that scene? And like, she's going to eat me. <laughs> That's usually my first response to danger. Freak out. Freak out. And then I need somebody who can sit me down and be like, take a deep breath, relax, it's not all bad. You know? And you do, you calm down, because we have each other to reassure each other in our faith, and to kind of bring logic to the situation. And this is what God does for the person we're going to talk about this morning. If you have your Bibles, which you will you open up Judges chapter 7. It's the, uh, yeah, chapter 6, I'm sorry. It's the seventh book in the Old Testament. It's between Joshua and Ruth. If you're watching online and you don't have a Bible, you can download one. If you don't own a Bible here, let us know, and we, we'll get you one. We'll gift you a, a Bible. Um, but we, we, uh, we're going to look at Judges chapter 6. And before we get into this, let me give you a little bit of a background, just really quick. Last week, we had spoke about Moses, and he, he rent to the land of Midian when he was escaping Egypt. Well, a long time has passed now, and the Midianites were defeated by Israel. Israel went to war with Midian, and, and they beat them. Now, Midian is kind of modern-day Jordan, kind of Saudi Arabia area. 
And what happened was Israel started getting a little cocky. They started getting a little bit too arrogant for God's liking. And the nation of Israel was blessed by God. It was protected by God. But Israel started saying, well, aren't we just wonderful? Aren't we just the greatest nation in the world? All these accomplishments and all these things have come from us. And because of that, God withdrew his blessing from Israel. He withdrew his protection from Israel. Now, oftentimes, doesn't that happen? We get blessed by God, you know, and God just, you know, he blesses us with whatever we may have. And it's very important for us not to get too cocky and we realize where all our blessings come from, where all our gifts come from. And this is what's happened in the land of Israel. They're getting too cocky and they're getting arrogant. And Midian is holding a grudge from being defeated by Israel so long ago. Now, the thing about the Midianites, the scripture says that they were like swarms of locusts. It basically meant they were breeding like rabbits. There was hundreds, thousands. There was so many of them. And the, the, the thing about it is, so they outnumbered Israel and have held the grudge with Israel. And this is where we're going to pick up the story. We have an incredible army who's angry at Israel. And God is going to use one man to try and stop the army from defeating Israel. So if you have your Bibles, would you open up Judges chapter 6? We're going to look at verses 11 and 12 first. Here's what it says. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under, under the oak of Ophrah that belonged to Josiah and the Abirite. <laughs> if someone knows how to say it online, spell it out for me. Right? Where the son of Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now, what was he doing? He was hiding in a hole with his knees knocking together so he wouldn't be seen preparing food by the enemy. That's what he's doing. He's hiding in a hole, threshing wheat. Look at verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Did I miss a chapter? He's in a hole, hiding from an army, frightened of being caught. And yet God looks and says, Hey, mighty warrior. Define a warrior. <laughs> what does it look like to be a warrior? Because if hiding in a hole is a warrior, I'm a warrior, <laughs> right? But what, what's he looking at here? So it's almost laughable because he's hiding, but yet God calls him a mighty warrior. And what's so amazing, and don't miss this, God saw something in Gideon that Gideon didn't see in himself. God saw something in Gideon that he didn't see in himself. You see, God sees us oftentimes as what we could be, not just as we are. Not, ju not just as we are. We all have potential to do amazing things for God. Every single one of us have that potential. And that's the mindset that Gideon needs to get into. And something happened with Gideon and all the insecurities and all these things happened to Gideon, similar to Moses. And I hope we all see this pattern because we see it with Moses. We see it with Gideon. We see it with David. All the same things that do mighty things for God start off incredibly insecure. See, Gideon was insecure because he was afraid that God wouldn't be faithful. He was afraid that God wouldn't come true. Look at verse 13. He says, but sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why is all this stuff happening? Why is this happening to us? Do you and I not ask that a lot of times when we're going through trials? Why is this happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? But the problem with Gideon asking it, sometimes over us asking it, is Gideon knew exactly why it was happening to them. God had withdrawn his blessing from them because they had gotten too arrogant and too cocky. Now, does that mean every time you're going through a tough time, God has withdrew, withdrew his blessing? Absolutely not. That is not the case. But in this case, it is what happened. See, Gideon already knew the answer, which I think is an incredibly honest and revealing thing that you and I don't have to be afraid to question God. <laughs> we don't have to be afraid to ask God the tough questions. He says, you know, God said, I, I withdrew my blessing because you guys stopped listening to me. That's why. And another insecurity Gideon had was Gideon thought that, that he wasn't good enough. Isn't it funny Moses thought the exact same thing? Gideon said, I'm not good enough. Look what it says in verse 15. But the Lord said, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Messiah and, and I am the least in my family. So who am I to do this? Who am I to step up to do great things? You know, have you, you ever sit at home and the rain is hitting off the window and it's a dreary day out and there's nothing on the telly and 
kids might be running around or you're at home with your partner or whatever it may be, and you're sitting there thinking, I'm going to do wonderful things for God. Do you ever think that? You know, I often think when I'm sitting at home, it's like, what good am I here? <laughs> like, what, what possible difference can I make in the world? And God says, you can make all the difference in the world if you're willing to trust in me. But you ever feel that you can't make a difference or, you know, that, that we just don't, we don't do big things for God? I'm sure Gideon felt the same way. You know, every guy, I think, I think it's fair to say, every guy dreams of being a hero. Is that not true? I need a little something. A li little interaction, guys. Do we not dream of being heroes? I'm going to prove it to you. I'll prove it to you, actually. Just knowing the audience here, I'll, I'll prove it to you. And if you're watching online, you, you can do this too if there's someone with you. If you're dating someone in here, you have a spouse. I want the girls, I want you to reach over and touch the guy's arm. Do it right now. Touch his bicep. Every person who just did that, the guy flinched. Every single one of them. Every single guy in here done it. You know why? Because we want to be the strong hero. Every guy does. And Gideon is full of insecurity. He's full of insecurity. But he still wants to do great things for God. And every one of you, you know, you know, during this whole pandemic, during this whole COVID thing, do you know that you as a church, all of you, have impacted people's lives for the better through this? And you mightn't even acknowledge it. You, you mightn't even take it on board because why? Because it's a very Irish thing. I, I sure look aware of that. It, it was nothing. But you have. Let me tell you, when we first um, kind of went into lockdown, there was so much fear and so much insecurity. People didn't know what to do. They were losing their jobs. They were being put on furlough. People weren't sure how they were going to feed their families. And the first thing as a church we did, we, we reached out to all of you and said, hey, we're going to put together a food drive and deliver it to families to make sure at least they have something to eat. And that was a big fear for families. You know what the result was? You guys stepped up and dropped off more food than that was needed for people in the church to have a meal. That's what you did. All right, there's one. All right. That's what you did. There was a fear, and the church stepped up and met that fear. Not too long after that, a month, six weeks after that, we started getting messages from people within the church that couldn't make rent, that couldn't buy medical supplies, that couldn't put food on the table, that couldn't pay their bills. And we started getting all these messages in. And we were like, how are we going to handle all of this? And you know what we did? We put out a message to everybody and said, guys, there's a need in our church. There's people who can't put food on the table. There's bills that aren't being paid. And there's people who can't pay their rent and they're about to be kicked out of their house. There was the fear. We put it out to you guys and the fear was met. All those bills were paid because of you guys. All of them were. Let's see if you clap for this next one. <laughs> but you know, the church has a need, and you've met the need. Now, because we haven't met since March, a lot of people, a lot of your generosity is out of control for so many of you. You really are, and we want to thank you all for that generosity, because so many of you not just give, you sacrificially give to make sure that this place happens. But since COVID, since we haven't been meeting, because of whatever circumstances, and I understand that all those circumstances are legitimate and real, our offerings have shot way down. And I want to present that need to you so I'm not coming in six months saying, hey guys, we're, we're out. <laughs> There's a need that the church has. We're not meeting our financial commitments. And I just want to encourage you to pray and consider and just talk to your partner, whoever it may be, to see how you can contribute. For some, it's just falling out of habit of giving. And that's okay too, you're human, we, we figured that out. But what I'm asking you and presenting to you, the need is we're falling short as a church to keep the doors open. What's going to be the result? Come on, you know it. You're going to meet that need. It's going to be okay. Why? Because we don't have a spirit of fear, but of power of love and of sound mind. Because this is our church. You know, you can give online, you can give at the back on the windowsill, but think about it and pray about what God would have you do. Where's the clap? You clap for the other two. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's a need. There's nothing to be. This is our church, and it's, our, it's, it's who we are. And now you know there's a need. Now we can meet that need. It's nothing to freak out about. It's just to know the need. And for those of you online, thank you, because I know so many of you watching give so generously as well. So we just have to fall back into the habit of knowing there's a need to be met. See, with God, 
and, and you need to hear this, with God, His strength through our weakness is exactly enough. It's exactly enough. His strength through our weakness is exactly what we need. See, look at what it says in 14. It says, the Lord turned to Gideon and said, go in, go in the strength you have, underline that, go in the strength you have, and save Israel out of the Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? Am, am I not calling you to this? You see, if God is calling you to do something, do you not think he'll give you the tools to do it? Do you not think he'll supply what you need to do it? Look at what it says in verse 16. The Lord answered, I will be with you. Who did he say that to last week? Moses. He said it to Moses. He said it to Gideon. He even said it to David. Guess what he's going to say to you when you're feeling fearful? I'm with you too. I'm with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites together. See, God, like I think Gideon, like most of us, you know, we have our doubts about God, don't we? It's like, I know you said you'd provide, but here's what I'm looking at in my bank account. <laughs> I know you said my marriage will be good, but I feel like choking. You know, I know, you know, we have these kind of checks and balances, you know, and we look at God and said, is he going to come through for us? Now, for the sake of time, what I'm going to ask all of you doing, those watching online, you, you can read all the signs that God gave Moses from verse 17 on. He gives three signs, three miracles. And I want to go through some, some of them here, what he says. But he's going to ask Gideon to face the army, but he's going to ask him to do it in a certain way. So Gideon sends out a memo to Israel, and he says, guys, we need to raise an army. We need an army to face the challenge that's about to happen. So he raises an army of 32,000 men, 30, half the population of Limerick. 32,000 men is what he reaches when he gets them. Now, the issue is, the Midianites have an army of 200,000 men. <laughs> I'm not a math, I think, what's that, six to one? About six to one. So he's thinking, man, that's, that's not enough. Why is he thinking that? Because he's thinking of it in his own logical power. He's thinking, this is how you beat an army, is with a bigger force. Look at what God says in verse, chapter seven, verse two. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men for me to deliver you into their hands, into their hands. It's like, you have too many men? Did you stutter? Well, how do I have too many men? I only have 32,000 men. But look what it says. With, with God, oftentimes the way forward is sometimes backwards. Do you ever remember those? Did any of you ever have slingshots when you were kids? Some of you probably still have them as adults. Do you, you know slingshots? How, do you, how does a slingshot work? It's got to go back before it goes forward. And oftentimes that's how God uses us. You know, whether it be with our marriage or our finances or kids, sometimes we have to go backwards for God to do what he needs to do to propel us forward, to go where it is God wants us to go. Look what it says in chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. In order, underline this, in order that Israel may not boast against me that their own strength has saved her. See, God is going to put them in a position where it's only God can deliver them out of it. Because if that doesn't happen, their arrogance and their ego will build back up and say, we did this. So God is going to put them in a position where they can't say that. He says, announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. He just lost 66% of his army. It went from 32,000 to 22,000. And God said, you know what? Sometimes the way of moving forward is moving backwards. But God also said, that's still too many men. Now, I'd start trembling here if I, was, if I was him, but look at what it says in verse 5 and 6. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord said to him, separate those who lap the water with their tongue as a dog laps for those who kneel down to drink it. 300 of them drank with cupped hands lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. Now, what does that mean? It means out of the 10,000 left, 9,700 drank directly from the, the, the river. Only 300 lifted with their hands to drink out of it. Now, you think Hollywood comes up with all these movies themselves? He was left with 300. 300. Facing an army of 200,000. Now, I don't care who, who, how you think it is. That's an almost impossible feat to pass. Can you imagine being those 300 men? You wonder, were those 300 men just suicidal? Or were they actually there to, with the power of God and the Holy Spirit in them? 
See, verses 7 to 19, you can read yourself for, for the sake of time. But let me tell you exactly what happened. God told those 300 men to grab a torch and a trumpet. And if I was them, I would have said, how about a sword? <laughs> torch and a trumpet. And God said, I want you to march around our camp, waving the torches, blowing the trumpets. And Scripture tells us that it drove the army crazy. It said it drove them so crazy that they ended up killing each other. And that's how God delivered Israel. See, at the beginning of the chapter, I don't think you know, anyone would have thought, man, they're going to defeat them by just mighty power and strength. But that isn't how God delivered them. Now, whatever you're fearful of, whatever stress you have in your life, whatever's going on, I'm sure you're thinking of a possible way out. But maybe that isn't how God is going to use it. Maybe God has a solution to your problem you've not even thought of. See, everyone looked on and said, that had to be God. It had to be God. So what in your life and situation right now are you going through where people are going to look at your life and say, that had to be God. The only way out of this is God. See, God sees something in you that no one else sees. No one. You mightn't even see it yourself. See, in times of when we're fearful, oftentimes the only way forward is backwards. So what's the application to all this? How are we going to apply this to our lives this week? As I said, God saw, God saw something in Gideon. He saw a mighty warrior. Gideon saw himself as weak and the least of his family. So what are some of the wrong beliefs you have about yourself? What are some of the wrong beliefs you have about yourself? You think you can't you know, serve? Why not? You think you can't come up and speak? Why not? What, what is it that you're lying to yourself about that God wants you to use? The second thing is, what has fear kept you from doing that you know God wants you to do? But what are you going to do about it? You know, sometimes what, what might be stopping us is complacency. Sometimes we've just gotten used to kind of floating through life and, and floating through things. But God has a purpose, not just for us as a church, but for you as an individual. He has a purpose for your life. And what he's going to do is he'll reveal that to you when you trust and are willing to do it. So for those of you who are wondering, you know, how am I going to get through this? What's going to happen? God sees a mighty warrior in each and every one of us, in each and every one of us. But if we're there for each other and we're there with the Holy Spirit living within us, we can get through this no problem. We might know exactly how he'll do it, but the end result is he will do it. Let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you that um, people in Sudan, Moses, Gideon, you know, Daniel, all these people, they were full of insecurities and oftentimes full of fear. And it's not a sin to be full of fear, but what is a sin is giving in to that fear. I just pray for all of us in this room and everyone watching at home that we can find our purpose and live out of that that we step up and be the church of, that's encouraging each other and building each other up and supporting each other and guiding each other, that when we come out of this, you're going to be looking at every one of us and calling us faithful servants. So I just thank you for your presence. I thank you for your, the gift of your Holy Spirit, and I thank you for everything you've provided us with. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Guys, for those of you watching at home, uh, we want to thank you for being with us. Uh, we hope you have a great day, and let us know you were there.